Today, Dialogues Without Limits receives Professor Roger White. Welcome, Professor White. Thank you. My pleasure to be very, very pleased to be here. Professor White works at Birmingham University in the UK, United Kingdom. Uh, he is also at Ironbridge, uh, the Industrial uh, Study Center. And he's collaborating with Brazilian scholars for several years uh, at the University of uh, UNESP, Sao Paulo State University, University of Campinas, UNICAMP. And he's also a specialist on late antiquity and is particularly on the archaeology of late antiquity in Britain. Mm -hmm. So this is the subject of our talk today. Yeah. And uh, the first thing to ask you is how uh, we define late antiquity uh, in Britain. What's the time period? What are uh, archaeological features that are typical of late antiquity in Britain? Okay. Um, the difference, if you're in France, uh, when you talk about the Roman Empire, you talk about Haute Empire and Bas Empire. Uh, and the division, which is common throughout the empire, is the time of Diocletian. Um, so it's two, it's roughly in the middle of the third century AD. So Diocletian came to throne in 284. Uh, and really you can trace it from that sort of period. And what characterizes it is the change from the individual emperor who controls the empire with a fairly small uh, uh, coterie around him um, uh, and the, um, and the uh, army, um, which is the early empire. In the late empire, you get a proliferation of the state, you get a proliferation of taxation, you get a, a much uh, increased bureaucracy and army, uh, and of course, ultimately, you get a change of religion which comes in after Constantine in 312 AD. So you get a, a it's a much more complex uh, uh, um, structure after Diocletian. And in fact, it looks much more medieval mm. uh, than, than the early empire. There's a definite break. It's interesting to note that uh, the <coughs> Cambridge Ancient History, the first edition in the beginning of the 20th century started just medieval Yes, it started just with Constantine. So yes, exactly. There is, <laughs> the, there is a real, there is a real break. Yeah, yes. but in the case of Britain specifically, yes. and you are referring to continental Europe, and in the case of Britain, yeah. um, what would you say? Uh, in Britain, the impact is is muted, uh, and in fact, one of my arguments is that we don't pay enough attention to it. We tend to see Britain because it's a small place. We tend to see it uh, as a single story, and also because. Uh, all the historical narrative that survives of the Roman Empire in Britain is weighted into the first element. It's the conquest and mm -hmm. the immediate aftermath. We have very little about what happened in the later period in Roman Britain. So when you read um, histories of Roman Britain, uh, you get this phenomenon that I call telescoping, as though you're looking at the end of a long telescope. And so that everything is everything happens, uh, it, 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 um, you don't get a sense of depth, mm. of time depth. You know, a year was a, still a year in the Roman period. <laughs> <laughs> and it, you know, the Roman period was 400 years long. And the way I say is, you know, if you think of that period, if you take uh, uh, the, the death of Queen Victoria and go back 400 years, you are back in the times of Henry VIII. Yeah. And this is very different. Britain is very different in the time of Henry VIII than it is in the time of Queen Victoria. And the same thing happened in Roman Britain. So we cannot, we must separate these two out. They are very different places. But in, in, in terms of specifics, one of the, the important element that I think happens, uh, we know that the province was divided from one into four provinces. Mm. And each had its own government. And what you get, I think, is when you devolve power, when you assign power from London into a provincial city and say, govern your own affairs and answer to us, then you create a whole new dynamic in society. So in Britain, you had four centers of power. London was still the most powerful, but uh, in Sirencester, in the West where I, where I was looking, what you get is a very different sort of society and they begin to go on different trajectories. So you would say that um, uh, from the 
late third century, there was this kind of uh, regionalization yes. of uh, power and also yes. of culture in the empire in general and specifically in Britain. It, it happens across the empire. Yeah. Um, and I think that they didn't think through the consequences. There were very good, re the reasons why it happened was to make tax collection easier mm -hmm. and to make uh, bureaucracy easier and to uh, separate army and state. Um, so the commands, the military commands are separate from the governments. So there are very good reasons why they did it, but they didn't think through. They didn't realize the what this meant. Yeah. Uh, and the parallels with modern Britain are striking. You know, the fact that we now have, when I go home, you know, there will be uh, the, the aftermath of the Scottish vote. Um, so the devolution, Wales, as you mentioned, yeah, they would just, they yes. use the same Absolutely. word to, yes. to refer to, yes. to, 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 uh, to uh, schemes. Uh, and specifically in terms of uh, Siren Sester, uh, the area you studied, um, what was the impact of, the, of Christianity? Because you mentioned that one of the features of the period was this radical change in terms of uh, cultural, yes. uh, the culture of the empire from a, a polytheistic or pagan society yes. uh, to a Christian uh, society, uh, the role of the church. and So the church kept this kind of central control. Yes. It's, an, it's an interesting problem. In, in, the, in the east of Britain, uh, basically uh, Christianity is introduced and it is interesting, you could take it up if you wished to do so. You weren't forced to, unless you worked for the state. Uh, if you worked for the court, or you were bureaucrat, bureaucrat or army, you had to become Christian. Um, but other people could make the choice. This is 312. Mm -hmm. By 380, um, everyone must be no Christian. Option. <laughs> There are no options. Um, so, but very soon after that, Britain left the empire. So we have evidence for Christianity, but interestingly, it's all in the East. Mm. Okay, it's not in the West. There's very little evidence in the West at all for Christianity. But after the Romans left, it reverses because the pagan Anglo-Saxons who take over in the fifth century, the Christians are maybe still there, but they have little influence. And there's good evidence um, that a lot of the people fled to the West. People who had something to lose, like Christians, fled to the West. And they reinforced Christianity on the West. So the, the, that, the Western side of Britain, what became what is sometimes called Celtic Britain, became much Christianized much earlier. And in fact, that is, that is the mechanism by which England is Christianized later on. So, so there is a uh, conflation of uh, Christianity yes, and the Celtic, heritage, Celtic roots. Yes. And in uh, mostly in the West and the hilly areas. And yes. Well, what's interesting, I mean, this is why, this is why I wrote my, my study of, of the Western Britain. You know, my question was, why, did, why is Wales uh, different from the rest of Britain? Because in the Roman period, it wasn't. It was part of Britain. There was no frontier. There was, no, there was no barrier between England and Wales like there is now. So where did this come from? And I think it came from this period mm. because by adopting Christianity, uh, the Celts were saying, we are different from you over there. It, religion becomes a form of identity formation. Mm. Uh, it's a way of stating difference. Their language, they hold on to British language because This is another way of saying we are different. So Welsh itself is invented in the same period as English is invented for the same reason, two cultures. And what's interesting about genetic studies now of people in the United Kingdom is that genetically, virtually everyone is Celtic. Mm. There's a lot of, you can pick up Germanic elements, but the bulk of the population are British. There's a very homogenized population. Uh, and what's interesting is that But the, that, that, the that, British that, living in England mm -hmm. learned to speak English and learned to be yeah, English. Yeah, that, that's interesting because uh, you're referring to a kind of a disjunction uh, between yes. uh, genetics and uh, identity and language. Yes. And uh, in a way we could say that uh, 
to have a completely different setting in Brazil, you also have this kind of disconnection. Yes. Most of people are of Indian descent, for example, yes. but still they speak another language and they are, uh, they, let's say, imagine themselves as yeah. something else, as, as you refer. I've just come back from Iceland. The Icelandic population had quite a shock. They did a genetic testing of the population. And most of the people are of British, Irish descent or Scottish descent. So Celtic. They're not, they're, yeah. they're not Viking at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they all speak Icelandic and they think of themselves as Icelanders. So uh, y your research uh, is, uh, was moved, let's say, by the fact that you were struck by the invention of Wales sometime. In this, the, from the Roman period yes, to, to the uh, yes. uh, high Middle Ages. Yes, but this came from archaeology. Hmm. This ultimately came from the site that I worked at, uh, because we were digging uh, in the 1960s and 70s and 80s, we had a very big excavation on a Roman town. And in the centre of this Roman town, we uncovered an archaeology very unlike anything else in, in, in Britain. We found evidence for... Uh, the selective demolition of public buildings, for the creation of private spaces and timber-framed houses on a Roman design. Um, there was very little artifactual evidence to back this up, mm. but it was very clear that occupation went on very late. And when we looked at the scientific dates, we were getting dates in the 6th century and the 7th century. Mm. And everywhere else in Britain, you can't see this. So we couldn't understand what was going on. So really it was my understanding of it has been driven by the archaeology. And so my, my research was really to see whether the, the city of Roxeter was different. You know, can you see the same evidence in Chester or in Sirencester or in other places in the West? And w would it be possible to relate this to the legend of uh, Arthur? Ah, well, this is yeah. <laughs> Arthur. Um, yes, because um, although Arthur was not a real person, yeah, of course. Um, he is an idea. Yeah. And he's a very important idea. He is an idea that generated the, uh, the concept of the Welsh. He politically and poetically becomes very important. So, um, and you can measure the importance of this. When Edward I, in the 13th century, conquered the last bit of Wales, he, the first thing, before he does this, he discovers the tomb of Arthur at Glastonbury. He discovers the burial, the um, uh, artifacts associated, like the round table, mm. like the crown of Arthur. And then he attacks the Welsh and he defeats them. And he builds a castle uh, called Carnarfon on the, on the North Welsh coast. And the design of the castle is dictated by a Welsh poem called the Dream of Maxim Vledig, where he builds, there's a castle described, and he builds this castle. And what he is saying to the Welsh is that I am more Roman than you are. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, has a real re resonance. And Arthur is a symbol. Uh, he captures and takes and appropriates the symbols of Arthur in order to bolster his claim to be more Roman than the Welsh. So it's a very complex and interesting story, um, but it's one you have to understand in the context of late Roman Britain and the society that created it. Well, Professor White, thanks so much for coming. Uh, I think that uh, your uh, understanding of late antiquity fits very strongly with the contemporary issues, as you mentioned, Absolutely. devolution and yeah. uh, Scotland and Wales. So uh, I'm sure that the public is amazed by kind of links we could do uh, between antiquity and modernity. So thanks so much for coming. My pleasure. Thank you very much for asking. And I invite everybody for the next issue of uh, Dialogues Without Limits. <laughs>